guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today I wanted to show you a quick little process for making faux leather. It's just made out of paper, so it's not going to be as strong as leather, but I think it would work great if you're making miniatures or very small books that won't have a lot of wear and tear on the hinges. Or maybe you're making a book and you want like an inset on the front cover that looks like leather but you don't have any or you don't want to go buy any or you want something vegan-ish-esque. <laughs> maybe this will help. Okay, the paper that I started with is this roll of brown, I think it's like packing or mailing paper. And it's not as thin as tissue, but it's not as thick as like copy paper. So this is a regular piece of copy paper. And when I put it in the calipers, it reads 0 0.09 millimeters. When I put this in the calipers, it's 0 0.05 millimeters. So I guess that would make it a little more than half as thick, but it's not tissue paper. The store I got this at is no longer in business, so I will attempt to find a suitable replacement and put it down below, either by itself if it's not at Amazon or I'll add it to the Amazon favorites in the uh, Booksmithables list. That being said, the thickness doesn't matter quite so much depending on what you're going to do with it. The reason why I made this faux leather was I was going to be covering some little miniature books and regular leather is just going to be way, way, way too thick, too bulky. It's just not going to work. But I wanted something that looked like leather. So that was my that was my thought process. Anyway, I will show you um, what I did. And no matter what paper you use, the technique should translate. However, it won't be as thin if you don't use something thin. Duh. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Obvious. Okay, so I went ahead and cut just a couple little squares off so that I can show you the two different ways that I um, made these because they they vary a little bit. And of course they're different colors because one of them just had different color paint in it. I'm gonna grab some little yogurt and uh, little containers that I kept from my, my applesauce a million years ago. It lasts forever. And I'm going to do this darker one first. So what I did was I grabbed some of my matte varnish you can get matte varnish in all sorts of brands. This happens to be the Liquitex. It's my favorite. They have a professional version and they have a basics version. They both work very similarly. This one is probably more concentrated. That being said, I think either one of these, use either one and you wouldn't know the difference. So I'm just gonna use the cheaper one because why use the more expensive one if you don't have to? This is on my Amazon Booksmithables list. If you have a Jerry's Artorama close to you or Dick Blick or Michaels, etc., you could probably get this locally. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna pour, I don't know, a tablespoon in there. And then I'm just gonna take some regular acrylic craft paint, just whatever you got. And what I what I want to try to accomplish is making that, this russet kind of color. So in here we'll go about a teaspoon of just brown. And it's called earth brown. And I want a little bit of, just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of black, like an itty bitty bit. I'm gonna say like the head of a quilting pin. And then as far as this yellow goes, this happens to be golden. So it's really super, super concentrated. I won't need as much of this as I would probably of a cheap brand. It's what I had in there. So I'm just gonna get probably about the same amount that I got of the black. And then this is red. Um, it doesn't really matter the type of red so much as long as it's not burgundy. 
And now I'm just gonna stir that all into that varnish medium. And some of you may be asking, well, can I just use some Mod Podge? And I'm gonna say, mm, probably not. I think I'm gonna put on some gloves because I split the end of this finger, I think because my hands were dry and it just split and I don't want to get any paint in there. My Band-Aid doesn't want to stay on at the moment either. It's really hard to put Band-Aids at the end of your finger, you know? And you're trying to protect the area at the end, but it's like, yeah. Struggle is real. This piece of plastic. Okay, so here is one piece of paper. I'm just going to crinkle that up. One thing I will say is that if, if you want to cover a book, like cover the whole thing, then make sure that you pay attention to the direction of the grain of the paper and note that on the back of it or something um, with a little arrow or something. Because when you put a book together, you want the grain to be running in the same direction as your spine in this direction so that you won't be breaking fibers when you open and close the book. That will help it to last a lot longer. So just an FYI. And in order to figure out the grain, you know, I'll just use this one. I can see that the grain is running in this direction. Let's see if I can get the camera to pick it up. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's definitely running in this direction. And I will prove that by ripping it. So if I rip it this way, see how it rips in a nice long strip? But if I try to rip it this way, see how it's jagged and it doesn't want to rip nicely? It's because I'm ripping through those fibers that are going in this direction. It doesn't know where to tear. But if you tear it with the fibers, it'll find the middle and it'll just rip. Now I gotta cut another piece. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so that's one way. If you don't have a whole lot of paper, then you might not wanna rip it, huh? Get my junky paint brushes. I always have junky paint brushes that I can do stuff like this with. All I'm going to do is take this mixture and paint it or brush it on this paper and let it soak in. You don't have to make it soppy or anything. You just don't want any dry spots. And the reason why you crinkle it ahead of time is because even though brushing this mixture on will flatten it back out, it will still retain those little wrinkle lines, the little crinkle wrinkles. The more paint you use in your mi in your mixture, oops, no. The more paint you use, the more opaque it will be. And if you use less paint, it will be uh, more transparent. And depending on what you're going for, I'm going to stipple over these brush marks because usually leather doesn't have brush marks, but the stippling should uh, camouflage any of those brush marks, make it look more like leather would look. Okay, I'm gonna set this aside to dry before I move on, and I'll do the other variation. Did I ever answer the question as to whether I think Mod Podge will work? I can't remember if I, okay, so maybe I did. If I did, then when I'm editing this, I will skip over this part. If not, here we go. So no, I don't think Mod Podge will work because Mod Podge isn't that great of a sealer. The polymers and whatnot that go into the matte varnish is different. It creates a more of a plasticized finish instead of Mod Podge's more of an adhesive. I mean, you can seal things with it, 
but those of you who live in more humid climates will probably know that sometimes when you seal something with Mod Podge, it can stay sticky. Like maybe it feels like it's drying, but then it just, it gets sticky later. And that's because of the humidity in the air and it attracts moisture. And the varnish doesn't do that. So that's kind of the difference. For this other method, this is what I have left over from when I made the other, but I'll tell you what it is. It's just water with paint. So instead of using the varnish and paint, it's, I'm gonna say a quarter of a cup of water with a teaspoon or two teaspoons of paint, depending on how opaque or translucent you want it. You can test it out. Your paint's gonna be different than my paint and your drips are gonna be different than my drips. And this is just another way of doing it. If you have a nice russet brown or whatever color of leather, you want already made up in a paint, then you don't have to mix any colors. But anyway, this is like a paint wash. It comes to like this one when I'm using the paint with the varnish, I try to keep my ratio to about, I'm gonna say four parts varnish to one part paint. So if you're using four tablespoons of varnish, then you would use a tablespoon or less of paint in that mixture. And then this is gonna be even less concentrated. You get a, it's a similar end result, but just a little bit different of a method. But I do the same thing. I crumple it up and make it all wrinkly. Then I'm just gonna douse it in this paint wash. And the thinner your paper is, the more careful you'll need to be because your paper will get real delicate when it's wet. I'm just gonna let it drip the excess off a little bit. And then I'm also gonna let this dry. Okay, I'll be back in, I don't know, five minutes or so. Maybe I'll get out the hair dryer. I think this one's mostly dry. This one's not, but I'll put it aside. Now for this one, I'm going to flip it over and on the back, I'm gonna give it a coat of the varnish on the back. I was on Reddit the other day and on the homepage, well, my homepage, um, there was a, a question I can't remember what subreddit it was in. But anyway, it was a question just asking Redditors experiences about what they call, you know, cheating death. Man, there were some really fascinating stories in there of things that have happened to people and maybe certain situations should have ended in tragedy, but for some reason it, it just didn't. But anyway, as I was reading some of them, I thought, I have a couple of stories and I bet you guys do too. I would love to hear your personal experiences about moments where things could have gone really, really south, but you made it out okay. While this is drying, I'll tell you what mine are. One was a definite where I cheated death, cheated death, <laughs> quote unquote. And then the other one, you know, you just don't know. I'll let you decide, how's that? Okay, I'm gonna set this aside to dry. Of course I got a hair in it. So the first one I thought of, I was an adult, so grown up. I was in my 30s. Anyway, I woke up one morning, and it was like a Monday, and my back was hurting. Not like a stabbing, like pinched a nerve. It was, it was more like, you know that hollow ache? But I had been doing gardening all the weekend before. I mean, digging holes, planting trees and shrubs and... So, you know, I was like, well, I just better be careful because I think I overdid it on my back. At the time, I cleaned, I think, three or four houses a week. You know, no, that wasn't great. Still went to work. But anyway, I tried to be careful. But within a few days, it had escalated, I should say. And I was starting to feel decidedly unwell. I even felt feverish 
and like the pain in my back was just not going away. And it was summer. There wasn't like a flu or something going around at the, at the time of nobody I knew had the flu or summer cold or anything. Of course it ended up that weekend. It was either Friday night or Saturday night. I can't remember which one it was. But one of those two nights, it got to the point where I told my husband, you know, I'm just gonna go to urgent care because I feel crappy. And so I go to urgent care and the urgent care is actually this one that I went to. It's when we lived in Indiana. This one was actually part of the hospital. It was not the emergency room, but it was right next to it. And I thought, well, if they send me to the emergency room, so be it. I mean, I doubt it. I just went to the urgent care. And the really nice doctor that was in there, he was pretty awesome. And he asked me a few questions and he says, your, so your throat's not sore, so I don't think you have strep. He says, but because you have back pain, he says, could it be a UTI? And I was like, I don't know. I've never had a UTI before. And um, so he kind of explained to me the symptoms and everything. I was like, well, no, I don't have, I said, my back hurts, but I don't have like, you know, the urgency and the, the pain when you urinate and stuff like that. I didn't have any of that. And he's like, well, I'm gonna test you, you know, we'll get a sample and we'll test you anyway. So he did and it actually came back that I did have an infection of some kind. So he puts me on antibiotics and sends me on my way. <laughs> and I was a good patient. I took the entire course, every single pill, and it was seven days worth. And at the end of the seven days, my back felt better. I wasn't feverish anymore, none of that. And I thought, yes. But within, I'd say 48 hours or less, the fever came back, the back pain came back. This time it was a little worse in the fact that like nothing tasted right. Like everything tasted like mud. It didn't matter what I ate. I didn't have an appetite, but I knew that I had to eat. So I'd choose applesauce or yogurt or something that would be easy on my stomach. And like everything tasted gross. So back I go to the urgent care. We had really good insurance, so it wasn't like it was costing me an arm and a leg or else I would have you know, waited to go see my regular doctor. But I went back to the urgent care because it had fallen onto another evening or something. So I just went back because they already knew me there. It was a different doctor this time, still really good doctor. He was pretty cool. And he just kind of looked at my record from when I was there before. And he said, you know what? He says, it's just one of those times where he says, I, I think you're just gonna need two rounds of antibiotics. Usually one course takes care of it, but sometimes it doesn't. So they gave me another round of the exact same antibiotic, sent me on my way. And again, I took every single pill. I took the whole course. I tried to rest as much as I could between work and all kinds of stuff, of course. But the exact same thing happened again, except this time it, I was even worse. So we're talking, you know, seven days of the first antibiotic with two or three days in the middle and then another seven days with another two or three. So we're talking three weeks by this point. And I looked gray, like my skin, like the color of my skin was real off, like it didn't look right. I was in a lot of pain and I was so tired, I couldn't even hold my head up. And my husband got home from work one evening and I'm halfway comatose on the couch. And he says, nope, we're going back. <laughs> he says that I'm gonna tell him to put you in the ER this time. You know how women are. We're like, no, 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 I'm gonna be okay. We usually downplay everything because who wants to go into the hospital, right? And then there's that other thing where, you know, you feel really, really, really crappy. And then you actually get up and you get in the car to go to the hospital. And inevitably you start feeling better. And I think it's adrenaline because you're not better. It's not like you're miraculously healed by the time you walk to the car. But I think it's like this adrenaline rush that makes you think, oh, I'm being overly dramatic. We don't need to go this far. This is ridiculous. You know, it happens to me every single time I go to the hospital. Anyway, we get back to the urgent care and it happens to be the first doctor I saw on the first round. 
and I go back there and he gets out my record, my chart, and he goes, oh, you've had two rounds and you're, you're back. And I said, yeah. And I said, I'm, I'm just not getting over this. I'm just, I just don't feel well. I did not tell him that everything tasted like mud. I told him I was tired and that my back still hurt and that I was running a fever off and on. And I had a slight fever while I was there because they take your temperature. But I forgot to mention about the everything tasting weird and I just didn't think about it. He says, I think you need to be admitted to the ER. And I said, well, I'd rather not. If there's anything that we can do without me being admitted to the hospital, that would be amazing. He says, well, against my better judgment, he says, I will prescribe for you the strongest dose of whatever antibiotic it was that he gave me. He says, this is the strongest I can prescribe without you having to go to the hospital and get an IV in your arm and get it through an IV. This is it. And it was for, I can't remember if it was for seven or 10 days, the course of antibiotics. And my husband was there too. So my husband was listening too. And he says, he says, but I'm going to tell you that if you get any worse whatsoever, and then he listed off some other things that I was supposed to watch out for. He says, I want you to get your butt back to the hospital. I want you in the ER because you can't mess around with this stuff. He says, but I can see that you're responsible enough to where this is your back for the third time. He says, so I know you're not going to ignore me. And I said, no, I'm not going to ignore you. I just really didn't. I told him, I said, I don't want to be admitted. I do not want to go into the ER, period. So he gave me that round of antibiotics and thankfully... That did kick it. After I got through that last course of antibiotics, I did start to feel better. The fever was gone, the backache was gone, food tasted like food again instead of mud, which was great because <laughs> I had lost like 15, 20 pounds. But even um, after I started feeling better, it took three months for me to get my strength back to where I was before it all started. It was almost six months of being affected by that one infection. But I was talking to my aunt a couple of weeks after that. She says, it is my guess that you had already gone septic, which means the infection has gone beyond the kidneys. It goes into your blood and then it's systemic. And then the infection is all over because that's why nothing was tasting right because you had already had systemic infection. She says, but the antibiotics, the first two rounds that you were on, fought back the infection just enough to where it didn't overwhelm everything and shut down all your organs. She says, because had you not been on antibiotics, she says, you can be dead in 48 hours. Before we had antibiotics, people died of kidney infections and bladder infections and all the time. They went bad and systemic and septic and people died within just a very short amount of time. That was the only one I ever had. I had a double kidney infection and I had asked the doctor, I said, you're saying this is a UTI. I said, but I don't have any of those symptoms. I just have the back pain. And he said, well, he goes, sometimes it can start with a, like a kidney stone that gets lodged even for a short amount of time. You can get an infection from all kinds of things. So anyway, so moral of the story is take all of your meds. Um, this is dry enough on this side, so I'm going to move on while I tell you the second one. <laughs> but I'm gonna turn it back over to the side that I painted with the paint and the varnish. And I'm gonna take some fine grit sandpaper. This is 220. And I'm just going to give this just a very, very light sanding. And it, what it does is it kind of just knocks off the varnish on the wrinkles that are raised. So, you know, like the little peaks of all the wrinkles. So you don't have to like go to town and, you know, rub holes in it. We're just gonna lightly go over it. So the second one was when I was about five and a half years old, because I was in kindergarten, I was walking home from kindergarten I had morning kindergarten, so it was over, I don't know, what, 11.30? But it was far enough in the school year to where I could walk home by myself 
and I will put a diagram on screen. Remember, I am an old person. <laughs> when I was a little kid, kids walked home from school by themselves all the time. It wasn't a big, fat, hairy deal. Don't think that my mother was some ne neglectful person or something. It, it was literally just half a block around the corner. I walked to school with my brother. Most of the time, I walked most of the way home with a couple other kids who lived kind of close to me, but they got home before I did. Anyway, on this day, I happened to be on the section where I was by myself for the last, I don't know, 100 yards, if that. There I go toddling along as I go home with my little backpack, and this car pulls up beside the, the sidewalk, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but it just barely knocked the shine off the wrinkles. Wipe off the dust. And I'm gonna grab my archival ink pad. And this one's in coffee. It's just a brown ink. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to run that over the top of this. And where I sanded it on the peaks of those wrinkles, this ink should sink in just to that part. Does that make sense? Anyway, this car pulls up alongside the sidewalk. This young man, I'm, of course, I'm five and a half years old. <laughs> I was almost six at this point. I'm gonna say he was probably no older than my dad and my dad was early to mid thirties. So he calls to me, he says, hey, hey, we're lost. Can you help me for a minute? I'm. I'm on the sidewalk, but there's like a, a fence to somebody's side yard and I'm close to the fence and not real close to the street because I was always told, you know, don't walk close to the street, try to stay inside the sidewalk, right? But I stopped because he called out to me. I didn't say anything because I remember not saying anything and I wasn't scared or anything necessarily. I just wasn't really sure, you know, I'm just a little kid. And then he reaches, down into the car next to the seat or whatever. And he had a candy bar in his hand and he holds it out, stretches his arm out as far as he can with the candy bar. And he says, if you'll just answer a question for me, you can have this candy bar. At that point, my little stranger danger radar just tripped. And I was like, uh-uh, this is not right. And I couldn't see the driver. I just saw this guy hanging out the window, holding out a candy bar, wanting me to get close so he can ask me a question and hand me the candy bar. But my little brain said, no, no, no. And I booked it. I just took off. I was fairly close to home. I just had to finish rounding the corner and cross the street and then I would be home real quick. The car started speeding up, but as soon as I turned the corner, they just went straight because I think they realized that I was in my driveway and that, that was that. That was the other close call that I can think of in my brain. I'm, I'm gonna assume that most of us have in our past something that we remember. Maybe it's something that you thought about later, but I would be real interested in um, hearing what you guys have to say. Let me know if you've had something that could have been tragic, but you missed it. So with this one, now that this one is dry, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do the same thing except I don't need to sand it because I haven't put any varnish on it yet. So when I do it on this one, it has more of a likelihood to soak in um, more places, not just the peaks. That's okay, because I just wanted to show you kind of what it looks like in both scenarios. And you only have to do it on one side unless you want to do it on both sides, but only one side will be visible. So just do it on one side. But I think it, it's just a little bit different. I think it has just a little bit different of a finish to where, depending on what you want to do with your faux leather, maybe you would prefer you know, one or the other. Then after this um, ink gets put on here, I usually let it sit for a good five or 10 minutes and sometimes I'll run the hair dryer over it just a little bit just to set the ink. And another thing I do, let me grab, I realize that this is a massive box, but it's the only one I have right at the moment. 
There is this massive box. I'm going to set that in there. And I have this matte clear spray paint. This happens to be the bare chalk unique matte finish. It's just a clear spray paint. I don't want glossy, but you could use matte or satin would probably be okay. But what I'm going to do is just give it just a very, very light spritz just so that the ink won't run. I'll set this aside while I have this out. This one is the first one that I did. And it gets a very, very light spritz. And the reason why I use the clear spray paint is because though it says it's waterproof, I was afraid that if I tried to put a coat of the varnish over the top of the ink that I put on there, that it just might smear it and make it all one color. But certainly if you don't have um, any clear spray paint, you could probably do another coat of the varnish over the top to seal in that ink. I would test it out first to make sure it's not just going to smear it depending on what ink you have. I know that sometimes um, the other Distress inks will smear and just become all one color if you put something over the top like this that has moisture in it, has water in it. So your mileage may vary. And then on this one, usually what I do after this is all sealed and dry, then on the back side, I will put a coat of the varnish so that it strengthens the paper because if you don't put a coat on the back, then it might not be as strong and hold up for as long. However, if you're gonna be gluing it down to something, say you're just gonna cover a panel for the cover of your, you know, inset of the front of your book or something like that, you could glue it down to a board or something like that on the back instead of putting a coat of the varnish. You use your Mod Podge and glue it down to a piece of light chip board or something like that. So there we are. I'll let this back of that dry. And this already has a coat on the back. You could put some of this over the top of this if you didn't want to do the spray paint. Um, spray paint's pretty cheap though. And now that the back is dry, you can flip it over and you can always give the front of this a coat of the varnish to really make sure that it's protected. This is a lot thinner than Mod Podge. Get gloppy is easy, as easily, I should say. And the spray paint is dry on this one, and this could also get another coat of the varnish if you want. And if you didn't feel like um, you could trust it as far as covering an entire book with it, you could do something like this one where you could use book cloth or book tape on the spine. And then, I mean, this is marbled paper, but you could have a leather cover instead of, you know, a marble paper. I think that would look real pretty. And um, once this is glued down to the board and everything, there wouldn't be any of this here in the hinge to uh, wear down or anything. You could use the book cloth or book tape. So that's another option as well. But anyway, that is it for this technique or two techniques, I, I guess. Maybe you will like one over the other. Let, let me know. And let me know if you had any harrowing experiences. As if you're comfortable, you don't have to. I, it was an interesting conversation on Reddit, and I thought it might be an interesting conversation for us. If you are in the mood to tell a story, please do so down below. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Maybe this little project helped with some inspiration today. I hope so. I hope everybody is having an excellent week, and I will see you all really, really soon in the next video. Bye, guys.